Well, gosh, I think it's time. I think we are ready to uh, introduce the first speaker um, for the day. Again, this is the third annual International Women's Day celebration. Um, the Google Developers Group in the Capital District is uh, helped to organize this, and Agora Media is actively right now uh, helping us put this together. So let's go ahead, Linda, and can you tell us about our first speaker? Yeah, so our first speaker, as you already know, it's Diana Rodriguez. She's a full stack developer DevOps, Google developer expert in uh, web technologies, Google Cloud Platform, Google uh, Maps Platform, and uh, Firebase. She's a woman take makers ambassador, a GDG Triangle co organizer, out O ambassador, and view v Vic Sense Worldwide community organizer. Currently, the Python developer advocate at uh, Maxmo. So let's, uh, I, I will head it over to Diana and she will uh, tell you more about uh, the presentation today. Thank you. Can you all see my screen? Or is, yes? Okay. Looks good here. Excellent. Yep. Well, yep. the title of my talk today is definitely fostering DevOps culture for success. I'd like to start with um, introducing myself first. Um, my name is Diana Rodriguez. I'm a Google developer expert and all those things. Um, you can also check me on Twitter at Katufa82. Uh, I love talking to people. I'm a person who, le who learns things every day. So let's not care about those titles or those badges. I am a developer and I've been in this industry for 20 years and definitely I'm not this woman. <laughs> if you don't recognize her, this is the Oracle, a cool reference from the Matrix. Hmm. So anyway, DevOps culture, hmm, what is this? I like the Vue.js documentation. I will read this paragraph with you and for you. And everything sounds great with a British accent, right? So I'm going to stop in a few key um, aspects of this uh, paragraph. The adoption of DevOps culture, tools, and agile engineering practices has, among other things, the nice effect of increasing the collaboration between the roles of development and operations. So first key takeaway, increase collaboration between development and operations. One of the main problems of the past, but also today in some realities, is that the dev team tended to be uninterested in the operation and maintenance of a system once it was handed over to the ops team, while the latter tended to be not really aware of the system's business goals and therefore reluctant in satisfying the operational needs of the system, also referred to as whims of developers. So. There's always been this little bit of a fight between developer and operations, developer and security, developers and, and QA. And you know what? That, that's, that's something we want to stop with. To illustrate the point better, my first job <clears throat> is a good way to describe um, from a personal experience what would the DevOps culture be. When I was 18 years old, my first job was um, in a reception of a, of a hotel and I had a, a relative who was in a key position of ownership um, and I was entitled you know I had the the, the feeling that I was going to be a manager right away and he said oh so you want to be a manager and you don't want to be at front desk let's give you the, the manager training and the manager training took three months I was with the handyman I was with security I was with the cooks washing dishes in the kitchen, delivering food, being a waitress at the restaurant, being in the laundry with housekeeping, making beds and cleaning rooms with the housekeeping personal. And ultimately I ended up uh, at the uh, front desk and I only had two days to learn the system. And I was pretty bummed. I thought, well, this is, this is not cool, this is cruel. And you know what, when I had my first check in, 
on my own after two days of learning the system and being in the front desk. I had to solve a number of issues. Like um, we had a rugby team with 24 people checking in. They were all angry and they had a massive jet lag and they just wanted to go in their rooms. And I didn't have enough rooms ready. But you know what? Having been with with the housekeeping personal allowed me to um, to know who I could assign a different room because I knew that side of the operation and I knew how long it takes to make a room and I knew what things were served at the restaurant at that time. So I signed a bunch of welcome drinks and sent them to the pool and recommended a specific cocktail and specific something to eat, you know, or just, you know, to munch. While I got the people I knew who could work the fastest, making the rooms and solving those problems. I'm not saying with this that you have to be heavily involved in every sector of the ecosystem to be able to solve problems and to be able to collaborate. But knowing a little bit of what goes on in every different area you're involved with helps you helps you um, build a stronger relationship with your team, appreciate your work, work in synchrony with the other sectors of the ecosystem in your work, for example. And, and and make this a process where everybody is involved. You don't have to change your specialty to become someone who fosters collaboration. You just have to collaborate and communicate. And that was the key for me to become a good leader. In this case, at the front desk. I eventually evolved to a management position, but this was, it was a really good way to start and a really good way to understand that knowing, oh, that's my diabetes sensor telling me that I am, I, I apologize. I have type 1 diabetes. Um, anyway, so um, knowing what happens with the other sectors can only benefit. But let's go back to the reality of, of, of nowadays. The industry fosters a culture of firefighters, rock stars ninjas and superheroes <sighs> this is so sad we are praising those who come to put out the fires we are shipping in our code the industry is praising those who are not involved with team building or team activities or even communicating to come and sweat the bugs we are basically building ourselves because of a lack of communication, unknowingly sometimes. We are praising the superheroes that come to save the day when we could have avoided a series of practices and mistakes that lead us to these horrible bugs, errors, fires, catastrophes. And on top of that, we are fostering that burnout and aggressive culture in detriment of our own health, which is pretty awful. But what if we could go for a peaceful environment, an environment where we can think of words like predictive maintenance, preventive maintenance? How do we do this? We are all in the same ship. Oh, ship. <laughs> we don't have to be the same to be one. The first key to this is communication and accountability, not to police anyone. Like my dad used to say, whatever performance that is not informed and not measured doesn't exist. We all have to own what we're doing. We have to take responsibility for the things we build. We have to inform and we have to measure our progress and our success. And there we have different technologies. We have agile methodologies, we have Scrum, we have Waterfall, you name it, it exists and it's there to help you. It's not something we should become 
it's not like it's it's not going to become our sector or our cult. We can combine different strategies and tools to find a common ground that will lead us to um, achieve the goals we're aiming for. From the technical perspective, the DevOps culture is all about the feedback. It's faster time to feedback. With the information we obtain from all these different sectors of our ecosystem or of our pipeline, we can design and automate these pipelines to improve the quality of our deliveries. With that feedback, we can design our code to gain insight around performance and usage. With that feedback, we can design our services to identify how can we drive the most value for customers and business because they're a part of our day to day. Yeah, we're developers. Um, in this case, I, I'm, I'm a developer advocate, but the feedback I get and my actions not only affect the sector I'm working on, it's a big chain that never ends. It doesn't start and end with me. It starts with everybody and ends with everybody. How we collect this data is key. So we can grab all this information, perform analytics against that data, and tune it over time to achieve improvements in usage. And this is not only about the technical perspective, it's also about the way we handle our teams, the way we handle our tasks, the way we deliver software, the way we conduct our practices in our day-to-day. -day. We can think of predictive maintenance based on these characteristics, based on the things we inform as a team, we inform as a person, and then use that to tune the way we move towards progress, towards achievements. We can improve performance, say infrastructure or our apps, to improve the quality of the service because we have the information, what's going well, what's going wrong plain. We can also modify and perform, and um, sorry, modify our performance based on customers' unique needs and actions. So we can also capture information from the outside that will help us improve our performance as developers and our focus as part of this big ecosystem. So feedback equals faster and better enhancements, faster and better updates, faster and better repairs, in case we're talking about the IoT industry as well, because why not? We're including everyone. Um, I'm going to skip through this process because I want to show you some shockers. And, and this will be the message I want to leave you with based on what has been said. This was a survey um, conducted by Alt Zero, and it's applied to the IoT industry in this particular case. But I think this embodies the whole developer ecosystem and what have we been doing? How have we been conducting our actions in, in, in the last, I would say, 10 years? So the first question was, do you believe that most IoT devices on the market right now have the necessary security in place? 90% of developers working in the IoT industry said no. Can you believe this? Do you trust having your personal data tied to these devices? OK, so the situation here is kind of even. No, but I still use IoT, 49% versus 51% of bless their cotton socks who still believe it's you know happening. It's, it's good. To make it, uh, to summarize all these horrifying responses, 52% of respondents Believe that most IoT in, uh, devices on the market right now do not have necessary security in place. Let's translate that to applications as well. 49% of respondents don't trust having their personal data tied to these devices, but still use them. Imagine this in the application world, because we had, uh, I think we had a, a huge security breach with Experian a little while ago. Imagine your social security number, your credit information, I mean, we are responsible for the tools, the technology and the software we're putting out there in the market and we're using on a day to day being in this industry. How are we letting these things happen? Right. 
Um, I'm going to skip through, but yeah, nearly 35% people uh, of the people surveyed claim that breaches of major companies have not had much of an effect on the trust or consumer interest in these brands. And I have a hard time believing that. The one that hit me the most, and I think we've, we've all been there, 85% of developers surveyed have felt rushed to get an application to market due to demand or pressure in the last six months. We are shipping the fires we have to put out. And then 90% of developers surveyed do not believe that IoT devices on the market currently have the necessary security in place. And these are the developers who are putting them out. These are the people who are shipping the products, the applications, the services we consume. And yet, there's no trust. There is definitely a problem if we felt that we have to put things out to production ourselves and, and we know they're not production worthy. Now, whims of whom? We are satisfying the whims of whom? Let's remember that right now the industry fosters a culture of firefighters, rock stars, ninjas, and superheroes. It's time for a change. And you are part of that change. And I know most of the time we feel like we have no idea what we're doing. Yes, I feel like that too. I've been in this industry for 20 years. And some days, things don't flow. But you know what? I'm doing my best. I'm being part of the solution. Communication and collaboration are the key to end with these practices. And the change starts right here with me, with my practices, with the way I interact with my team. One person has a bigger effect than all the publicity. You know, I could be talking about this forever, you know. Another important important thing is let's not glorify the burnout culture. Such things as junior debt for life, no, that's not true. We're all developers. We all have different skills and things to put to the table. We all have the power to make a difference, regardless of how long we've been in this industry. We are part of a big puzzle, and like a puzzle, Every piece is different and there's no piece, no, no two pieces of a puzzle that are equal, which is why we need all different levels of experience. We need your motivation. We need your ideas and what you have to bring to this amazing ecosystem. Remember, play, uh, praise yourself. Remember to give yourself a pat on the back. And I know this might not be enough time to convey my message clearly. But I know that if we have this in mind, even this little bit of a seat, you know, um, and, and we try from our own um, offices, our freelancing practices, our consulting jobs, our teams, ourselves, we can make a difference. Let's talk collaboration. Let's start communicating. Thank you very much. This is my Twitter account, and um, this is the link to the slides. And if there's anything I can do for you, or if there's anything you like to talk about, you can always um, talk to me on Twitter. Thank you for this opportunity, and if there are any questions, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you. So I have a question as we uh, give people a, a chance to um, uh, type some stuff. Uh, let's see, the first question, um, in the chat that I see here, talking about data security and privacy with the um, Internet of Things devices. What is your take on the Earn It bill? I'm not familiar uh, with the Earn It bill. So are is, you, and if you know the Earn It bill, yeah, can you give a quick yeah. bit on what that means? And uh, it's, it's a complicated sub subject. I think it would take me a, a bit too long to to give you a, a good response about that i would say um at the moment we're on a chain of pressure from 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 the sea levels the marketing offices 
and analysts who have no idea how the development processes work. I think educating the other side of the ecosystem would actually help us promote better and safer practices. But if you want to talk about the Earn It Bill on Twitter, I'll be here and I'm ready to talk about it because it's it's a long subject. <laughs> We had a, an interesting, this is unrelated, um, but speaking of bills uh, and, and uh, legislation that affects um, bandwidth specifically, uh, do you remember, Diana, we were having a, um, one of our practices and she was on one network and was having some trouble with the video and was like, hold on a second, she switched networks and suddenly she had full bandwidth and it was very, it was just one of those revealing um, uh, situations where you could see what we call in the states maybe net neutrality and 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 how that affects uh um, our networks uh and i guess security you know and on some level if it's uh right if it's working it that hard yeah yeah <laughs> yeah you know the, uh, the, the earn it bill is basically about that sorry for interviewing interrupting your chat the, the, it's it's a no. bill to scan every message that has been shared online which is why you want to go in deep with that message but yeah Taking from a co corporate network to a free network, the the, mess, the um, camera quality was absolutely different. And this was something that totally shocked me as well. I think we have the power to raise our voices and to talk about the things that are wrong. But if we don't speak up, no one else will do it. You know, no, no one, like nothing is going to happen if we don't bring up those subjects, you know, to the table. That's very true. Yep. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much for that talk. Um, remember, we are recording this. So after the fact, if you miss something or if you're coming in uh, just now and want to uh, review uh, what Diana just said, um, uh, come back to the Meetup uh, uh, site and you'll see links where we'll post all the media related to this event. Um,